The year is 1988. Welcome to Japan, the land of the bubble. Where people have been doing so well financially, they developed a medical condition which makes them hemorrhage money upon contact. In a nearby lot, we see a strange man who hasn't contracted said condition, so he asks Dr. Kiryu Kazuma for help. <laughs> Apparently, beating him repeatedly didn't help the issue. After finishing his medical shift, Kiryu goes for an enthusiastic walk in order to give money to a random guy in a car. Now, he must be important since we have dedicated a nearly four minute long cutscene to him. And what does this mysterious figure have in store for us? Nothing. He literally dies off screen. Great! Oh, hey, it's our bestest buddy in the whole wide world, Nishikiyama! If the five fangirls passed out behind us didn't clue you in, he is the drop that gorgeous sidekick of this adventure. He will also serve as the convenience tutorial giver, and first on the agenda is the key mechanic of Yakuza Zero Karaoke. After 17 hours of failing at the minigame, because I'm not used to Xbox prompts, we start drinking till the sun rises. The following day, we wake up to a news broadcast about a mysterious dead guy found in a nearby lot. Oh, would you look at that, another off-screen death. Surely this won't become a frequent occurrence. Being the good friend that he is, Japan's top Olympic swimmer Fishkiyama tells us it would probably be a good idea to visit our superiors and clear up any misunderstandings about this incident. Man, what a nice guy. I really hope we get to be friends for at least another 20 years or so. And so, we travel all the way to the foreign land of Hollywood headquarters to speak to our superiors. May I introduce to you Kuze, star of the hit movie George in the Jungle. Shibusawa, best known as Simia Gyakan in the cult classic Alarm für Kobra 11. And last, but certainly not least, Awano, the star of Casablanca. Back to the topic at hand, apparently the man we tried to rehabilitate with our fists was shot to death. Now, since Kiryu is not, in fact, a member of the Stardust Crusaders, his punches aren't followed up by the sounds of gunshots, meaning that he couldn't have possibly killed this man. Dumbfounded by this very logical train of thought, two of our superiors leave the room and let Kuze handle this monkey business. Kuze, in turn, says he will let the murder accusation slide if Kiryu can prove that he is canonically incapable of killing anyone. Kiryu accepts and thus starts his fisting journey to the top of Dojima HQ. Once he reaches the top, it looks like Kuze was never actually going to let the murder charge go. Shocking, I know. So now you'll actually have to fight him, making this the first boss fight of the game. Normally, this would be the point where you'd see some glorious beat-em-up gameplay. However, this game does not have a New Game Plus option. And I'm not going to re-grind the equivalent of Yugoslavia's economic worth to get some footage, so let's just pretend that Kiryu instead challenges Kuze to a karaoke battle. I won. Oh hey, a new record! As if on cue, the other superiors come in with a cake to celebrate this nice turn of events. Now all Kuze has to do is cut the cake and everything will be alright. Uh, Kuze? Buddy? They... they didn't give you the cake yet, you know, you can put down the now. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, cool. Wait, they look mad all of a sudden. I can't put my finger on it, but they seem kind of... Oh! So it turns out that the man up top, Dojima Kong, is furious because you broke his phenomenal karaoke record. So he does what any sane person in this situation would do. He fires Kiryu in order to legally remove his karaoke score from the system and remain on top of the leaderboards. Cool, now Kiryu is out of a job. You might think that he could just beat up two more goons and be set for life, but the story dictates that he has to pursue a more legitimate career. Luckily, we're then approached by a totally not suspicious looking fella who creaks while he walks. Not only that, but Deus Ex Machinima over here invites us to take a shower at his place. Well, I see nothing wrong with that. Let's go! Soon after, the man who invited us over regrets his decision, as Kiryu spends three hours in the shower singing karaoke by himself. La 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 la, do you overlap? 
Unfortunately, singing is the prime component of being a good real estate agent, so Kiryu is hired on the spot. But not before this mysterious man, named Tachibana, shows off his skills at electromanipulation, making him a top contender to be the next protagonist for the infamous series. Now that all of Tokyo is successfully out of electricity, we have to move the story somewhere else. And may I present to you... Somewhere else. In a mysterious city located 1700 miles off the coast of Nova Scotia, world-famous mercenary Venom Snake is tasked with the infiltration of the Japanese underworld. To do so, he dons the disguise of a respectable cabaret manager codenamed Goro Majima. After successfully using CQC on a blood-drunk ape, he is visited by his superior, Liquid Sagawa. Sagawa serves as the ever-so-persistent roadblock preventing Majima's rise through the underworld. The idea is that you're supposed to earn an insurmountable amount of money to buy your way in. Which, considering the pre-established money hemorrhaging condition, shouldn't be hard. But we might as well pretend that it is, because economics are weird and stupid. I should know, I studied that in college. The next day, we are given what could presumably be our last big job before entering the underworld. The premise is simple, kill a person named Makimura Makoto. The fact that this is a general neutral name surely won't play a role in a plot twist later on. We go to a massage parlor to find our targets, but actually wind up playing Marco Polo with a blind girl, which somehow transitions to a lengthy massage scene. I can assure you, this is not a JAV setup. Majima enjoys himself a bit too much and wakes up to find his actual target staring him down. The Massive Man, who is canonically named Massive Man, does a pro-gamer move and challenges you to a game of darts to prove your innocence. Fortunately, this is not Yakuza 3, so this segment goes pretty smoothly. After the encounter, we have developed a bond with the Massive Man, who then entrusts us with the safety of the real Makimura Makoto, who is targeted by everyone from here to New Orleans for no particular reason. Makes you wonder why they didn't just alter her appearance so she wouldn't be easily recognized. Like, you'd be surprised what a new haircut and the prefix Joe can do for one's public image. Wait, I think we're getting sidetracked. <clears throat> anyway, Majima saves the girl from her many assailants, and instead of killing her like he's supposed to, he remembers the whole ordeal with Quiet back in Mother Base and decides to let her live for now. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, Kiryu decides it's time for a makeover and spends the day relaxing with Tokyo's biggest supermodel, Guchiyama. Since literally nothing of importance has happened since he got his new job, they decide to visit the karaoke place, where Kiryu misspells his best friend's name worse than me five seconds ago. After another five hours well spent, we are visited by Awano. It seems that he is rather offended that Kiryu is still out there seeing karaoke, bringing even more shame to Dojima Kong's amazing singing abilities. We are therefore threatened to never pick up a microphone again if we want to live. But Kiryu instead sings the song Hell Sue, which shouldn't canonically exist for another 31 years. This disrupts the space-time continuum and thus teleports Awano and his underlings away from the bar. Now that Dojima and his underlings are clearly vying for our head, Kiryu is forced to go into hiding. In order to do this, he decides to study ninjutsu to master the skill of perfect disguise. Sadly, Ryan Acosta was stuck hiding on Mount Rushmore, so Kiryu decides to seek out the next best thing, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Kappas. Upon entering the sewers in his brand new clothes, great idea by the way, he is instead visited by Kuze doing an audition for the next Ghost Rider movie. Now, as you can tell, we can't exactly have a karaoke fight here, because there are no karaoke machines around. This is looking pretty bad. As Kuze slowly walks towards us to deliver a mighty blow, he slips and falls into the sewage, presumably breaking his hip. Okay, so Kiryu just walks away. Crisis averted. But this does not mean that Awano and Shibusawa won't come after us next. So we start running again. As we exit the sewers, we are miraculously saved by the legendary escape artist Iroquois Pliskinyama. They decide to go camping out of town until the heat dies down. Unfortunately, they didn't pack a tent. Not knowing how to pass the time, they decide to play Truth or Dare with a gun, a common pastime in Slavic countries. Kiryu is then dared to commit a crime, so he decides to steal their only car and leave famous poet Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkinyama in the forest. Thanks, Kiryu! Meanwhile, on Mother Base, 
Majima decides to question Makoto why she's being hunted by literally everyone in the universe. Apparently, she has selective amnesia and can't remember. So Majima decides to use the same foolproof method he used on Paz back in Phantom Pain, showing her random pictures to hopefully jog her memory. This doesn't work because Makoto is blind. But this does make her pass out just like Paz. Hey, little victories, right? Massive Man, in the meantime, gives us an idea to save Makoto from the people hunting her. He decides to get rid of a girl who looks exactly like her and leave Makoto's work uniform at the scene to fool everyone into thinking she's dead. Majima luckily thinks this is a pretty dumb idea and drops the clothes in a puck that mysteriously disappears in the Dragon Engine. The next day, however, it seems that Makoto's lookalike is still dead, just according to Keikak. Great, now we have a mystery murder case on our hands as well. Unfortunately, Kimura Takuya is unavailable as his motion capturing for Judgment 5, The Yuma Lives On. Fortunately though, the culprit of the duplicate's murder decides to immediately reveal himself and request a meeting. What we then find is a strange man sitting in an empty cabaret talking to himself. Apparently, he wants to challenge Majima to a one-on-one -on -one fistfight to see who the true successor of Hokuto Shinken is. In fact, he's so confident in his fighting prowess that he called the police on himself ahead of time to further prove his superiority. Unfortunately, he forgets that this is a Yakuza game, so by the time we're done with the mandatory expository dialogue, the police arrive and take him away. Realizing that there are literally no sane people left in the city, Majima decides to take Makimura and Massive Man with him to Mother Base and abandon his mission. To no one's surprise, the plan doesn't work out, and Massive Man turns into my favorite mellow death band, In Flames. Looks like Sagawa wasn't happy with our recent activities and decides to kill us right then and there. But he's then outplayed by a random dude who just teleported behind him. Like, seriously, he's wearing a bright white suit. How did no one notice him before? Back to Kiryu, literally three seconds after he returns to Tokyo, he's ambushed by more enemy NPCs than you'd see in Tsukimino on Legend difficulty. When all hope seems lost, Deus Ex Tachibana comes to the rescue, revealing that he is, in fact, the Fast and Furious 88, and that family doesn't get left behind. He then Tokyo drifts off into the night. After he wakes up from his mandatory visit to the beach, he reprimands Kiryu for not doing anything that a real real estate broker should do. So he gives him the task of locating the owner of a specific unmarked property. The owner of the property is, of course, the girl who cried Takoyaki. I know, brilliant plot twist. Whoop, we're back to Majima again. You still with me? Okay, the plot gets really, really simple from here on out, I assure you. Majima gets punished for not killing Makoto, which starts up this game's version of the torture sequence. Just like in Metal Gear Solid 1, you're supposed to mash the circle button to survive. Fortunately, Steam has a little something called Turbo Mode, so we finish the segment in record time and are awarded the Star of Bethlehem, an overpowered item which allows us to skip any and all cutscenes and gameplay segments. So Majima decides to do what any good speedrunner would do and rushes to the end. Boom, we literally skipped four full chapters of the story and we're finally at the finale. So, what's the deal with the endgame? Well, most of the characters that I've mentioned thus far that seemed kind of important have... Uh, died. But this is a prequel, so is anyone really surprised? Makoto is stuck in the hospital, so the ownership of her property is up for grabs. Majima, on the other hand, is angry, because he developed feelings for her, so for once, he decides to go the non-stealthy route and kill his way up the corporate ladder to finish his mission with style. Meanwhile, Kiryu decides to end the Dojima family's terror over the world of karaoke by defeating them all in a fair one-on-one, -on -one, where the loser would be sent to the Shadow Realm for, like, a week. First in line is Senor Poke. Seemingly being the only man with a hint of honor in this story, he offers you the chance to sing Bakamitai as a duet. Upon finishing it, the two of them become really close friends. Aw, that's sweet. Kiryu then takes a conveniently placed cab to a random unnamed port to find that Shibusawa, the guy who literally did nothing for 90% of the story, is apparently the last man we need to outsing. But to get there, we first need to beat a literal boatload of his underlings, because the man is apparently Nugget's daughter. 
Fortunately, the indomitable Gishki Amagas Kraken uses his arcane abilities and summons forth his army of fish friends to completely eradicate all the enemies preceding Shibusawa. Thank you, my best friend. We now have to wait for Majima to catch up to the story because the perspective in this chapter changes around 50,000 times. Boom! Majima CQ sees the hell out of any NPCs left in the game and is met by Mr. Humphrey Awano Bogart. He tells us that this mission we were given was actually just a cover-up by Cypher and that we will surely regret our actions up to now. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. And before he can even finish his quote, Majima opens the Bible and reads his favorite quote. Omae wa mo shindeiru. This ends his story in record time. Overall, we're awarded with an A rank because we used the Star of Bethlehem. Back to Kiryu, finally. This legendary story that totally made sense up to now and was totally not made up can finally conclude with a clash of angelic voices. And the song they pick is obvious. Contrary to his reputation, Shibusawa is actually a phenomenal singer and he and Kiryu are neck and neck by the time the solo section concludes. But when all hope seemed lost, the hero we truly don't deserve returns once again. The inspiration behind the anime sensation of the 80s himself, Akira. With their combined strength of vocal cords, Dojima's reign of terror has finally come to an end. Japan is now free to enjoy karaoke wherever and whenever they want. Not for competition or some petty title, but for fun. Like any good overly cinematic game, this beautiful story leaves us with a post credit scene. Majima decides to maintain his identity, so that he can grind out some more GMP for his still growing mother base. While taking a stroll through the Tokyo map, he meets an old frenemy. Being the trained soldier that he is, he sees through his disguise immediately and speaks up. Why hello there, Kiryu-chan. Or should I say, Liquid Ocelot. <laughs> to anyone that actually watched this to its completion, first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, happy April Fools! This is the polar opposite of the content I usually do here, so it felt like the perfect upload to release today. Might as well call it a part of my Slavic lineage at this point, since this reminded me a lot of Rata's Pot of Greed parody video, and I'm already anticipating that I'll be equally annoyed by the existence of my ironic video like he is with his own. But anyway, if you'd like to prevent something like this from ever happening again, feel free to join the members of this channel so we can go back to doing serious Yakuza analyses in the future. And that's all from me. Until next time, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Cheers!